let's just start with the VO2 max training. So you're having people go through a little bit of a workout before they get going. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, I do most of my VO2 max testing out, outdoors now. I use that VO2 master device, which I, I love. I'm going to leave from my house. I'm going to ride 10 to 15 minutes to the place where I do my hill repeat. So that's a warm up in and of itself. And by the way, getting there, there are a couple of short little climbs where I'll do like 30 seconds of, you know, relatively high power just to get up over a little pitch. I will do two to three full runs of the hill at escalating power before I'm truly going to hit my max. So I'll do like a four to five minute up at a maybe 85% of what my maximum power would be for that climb, come down for the same amount of rest period, go up again at maybe 90% of what my maximum power would be, come back down, and then maybe I would go and give it like that the third one would be out there. So by the time I've, I've done it, I've really warmed up. And so the other day I was talking to a patient who did his VO2 max test at a facility. It was at a university that he went to do it. It was just like a place where you can go and pay to do it. And I was kind of surprised at what his number was. It was lower than I expected given his training. And I, I said, tell me about the protocol. And he's like, yeah, I just got on the treadmill and they just started cranking it. And I was like, and how long after you started on the treadmill, did you hit VO2 max? And he's like, I don't know, five minutes. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's a garbage protocol that you were not warmed up and ready to do that. And you mentioned you have a VO2 max coming up. Um, when was the last time you tested prior to this? In the spring. It's about six -ish months. And there, and the reason is like, because I like doing it outdoors, I, I have noticed because I live in Texas, um, how much of a performance hit I take in the summer. Like it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a noticeable difference in the summer. So I'm like, yeah, I just would rather do it in the spring, uh, fall, winter, spring is when I prefer to test. And like, let's say the month leading up to it. So the past month, have you changed your training at all? Are you doing anything in particular for it? No, no, not at all. I'm just, this is just a, a data check. It's just like, you know, I had my blood drawn this week, uh, had my DEXA scan a couple of weeks ago. I'm doing a VO2 max. In general. So if you haven't changed anything, just as a reminder for people, what does your like VO2 max training look like in a typical week? Is that one day a week? Are you doing it multiple? Just one day a week. Yeah, it's three days a week of zone two and one day a week of, uh, of, of interval training. But, but interval training at that specific sort of four, five, upper limit, eight minute intervals. And I always like when we talk VO2 max training, I think back to one of the actually first video podcasts we ever did with Alex Hutchinson. And do you kind of want to walk people through, I think a lot of times when you think of VO2 max training or Tabata training or like going all out, a lot of times people kind of like lose sight at how hard that actually is. Like, do you kind of want to walk through, if you're doing actual intervals, real VO2 max training, like what that feels like once you're done? And Well, VO, VO2 max training hurts less than a true Tabata. I mean, a true Tabata is, uh, again, that's where I think people have a hard time understanding what all out means. I mean, technically, I don't think the human body is capable of going all out for more than 10 seconds. So even at the level of a Tabata, which is a 20 second effort followed by a 10 second rest repeated eight times or done eight times, um, mm -hmm. even a 20 second there's just a governor that is like self-regulating how hard you go. Um, the reverse Tabata where you go 10 seconds all out, 20 seconds rest for eight rounds. That's about the closest thing that I think we're capable of doing as a truly all out. Um, and, and you will increase your VO2 max doing that type of an exercise, but not nearly, not nearly as much as if you're doing intervals in the three to eight minute range. Um, and by definition, if you're doing something for three to eight minutes, you're not going all out. What you're trying to do is go as hard as you can for that distance and for that time. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a different animal. Obviously I think it hurts more cause it's just, you know, it's a lower level of peak pain, but it's spread out over a longer period of time. So the area under the pain curve is greater. Uh, but it's, but it's, it's, it's far from all out. And at any moment in time, the pain is not the same. And can you remind people, like, let's say you're doing a four minute interval, you're not starting at four minutes going as hard as you can, and then trying to sustain it. Can you walk through kind of how you think about 
like the energy you put out are spread across four minutes? Yeah. Well, now technically the power is constant throughout the four minutes. So I know in my mind what I, how many watts I want to produce and what I want my average wattage to be over the five minutes. So let's just say I want to do five minutes at 300 watts. Um, of course, you're outdoors, so you don't have complete control. It's always jumping around. But, but I'm really watching the, t the three second power tracing and the average power to keep it there. Well, after the first minute, I barely know I'm on the bike. Like it's, it should be really easy after a minute. If you're dying after the first minute, you've set your target too high. Um, um, two minutes in, you know, or two and a half minutes in when I'm halfway done, I still feel pretty good. My heart rate is now going to be within about five beats of what its maximum is, um, but I still feel pretty good. It's really at about minute three, three and a half that the pain train starts to leave the station. And that's when it really starts to feel miserable. And that last minute is, is really, really difficult. And um, again, if you've done this right, when you, when you finish this, you're really going to need that four or five minutes of very, very easy pedaling uh, to let your heart rate come back down uh, to, to then repeat it. But again, the goal is not to have killed yourself in that five minutes such that you can't do it again. Cause what I'm trying to do is actually preserve that power across all the intervals. Last follow up on this is you talked about the consumption and like the increase in performance as a result of like what they're able to consume, um, when they're performing, how much of a difference like, do you think that makes, or how can you explain it to like a lot of lay people probably aren't thinking about that consumption or their mixture. I know a lot of endurance athletes are, but like how much of a game changer do you think it is to have that increase in what they're able to put in their body during events? Well, again, for people like me and probably most people listening to this podcast, it doesn't, this is not something that should be on our radar. Like I'm, I don't think there's ever going to be a day when I'm doing a 10 hour endurance event again. Um, and therefore I don't really need to worry about it. Like it's, uh, you know, if I'm exercising for two hours, that's, that's kind of a long time. So again, at two hours, I'm fine with just water, uh, and my, you know, and I'm living off my own glycogen and you know, whatever. Um, but it's very difficult now to think about people competing at a world-class level in cycling, uh, and, and Ironman because, what Olav and many others have now argued is the problem of peak endurance is effectively an energetic problem. It's basically a question of how much chemical energy in the form of food can you convert into electrical energy via the metabolism of food back into chemical energy in the form of ATP back into mechanical energy. Like there, it's just, it's just an energy transfer problem. Okay. And more energy input means more energy output, right? The more input, the more logs you can put into the fire, the hotter the fire burns, the more steam it makes, the faster the wheel turns. That's basically what it comes down to. And what we've seen over the past decade is quite literally a more than doubling of the feedstock that goes into the furnace. Uh -huh.